Oi, oi, it's your boy, Yuzi. How are you doing? Uh, welcome to another episode of Through the Door Podcast. Um, if, like me, you write, create music and um, mix your own music and you've ever wondered what actually goes on behind the curtain of mastering, uh, you know, do we need it? Do you need to pay for it? Is it like genre specific? Do you need it in electronic music versus... Um, you know, uh, band sort of like live instrument music. Um, all of these questions I've always pondered. Um, and for me, the fact of the matter is you do need mastering, definitely. Um, you need to have your tracks mastered. But why? What's the importance of it and what goes into it? So we reached out to a Streaky, um, a streaky Mastering, uh, or actually, if you just head, head over to Streaky, yeah, www.streaky.com. Um, and, and check his website out. He has been the mastering engineer for um, artists like Ed Sheeran, um, Paul Weller, Skepta, uh, Groove Armada, Kasabian, Lily Allen, uh, it, it, the list goes on. Um, so he's got a real good knowledge about w- what the actual process does, why you need it. Um, also, if you are interested in actually tapping into mastering as a career, um, he's got loads of knowledge uh, and his own mastering academy that you can actually sign up to and, and, and you know start the process for that so yeah uh, super interesting chat and um, enjoy don't forget to smash the subscribe button and um, follow us on whatever pro- um, platform it is that you're listening to us on if you're watching this on YouTube subscribe to the channel uh, the Broken Bricks is the channel uh, go check out Broken Bricks. Uh, we've got some new releases that, are, that have just come out, so get over to your streaming platforms, type in Broken Bricks, have a listen. Right, cool. Uh, I'll let you get on with the podcast. Sweet, see you in a bit. That's all right, no worries. I totally uh, forgot, if I'm totally honest, I've forgotten about it. My assistant said about doing it this morning. I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. It's all good. It's That's all, all right. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, man, I just, um, yeah, we reached out. Uh, we, we're interested in in talking about all things essentially that really help our listener, which is normally kind of like the musician, aspiring producer out there, just to grab hold of any kind of online tools, uh, tips and, and, and bits of information that they can get to help them on their way, whether that's, you know, writing music, recording music, what you know, the mixing, mastering process. And you, you do, you, you're quite prolific online. <laughs> <laughs> and you I'm busy. Just, yeah you just kept coming up and coming up and i was like i need to look <laughs> into this guy and uh and then i was like yeah this this guy seems like he'd be an excellent fit just to kind of hear your thoughts on some of the stuff to do with kind of mastering because well you know yourself i mean you've been in the game for quite quite a number of years dealing with with lots of different kinds of uh people on different platforms and 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 how that's kind of shifted and changed into this world where people yeah. are just flipping open a laptop and, and getting on with creating and i think that has a two-edged sword right you've got all this wonderful content being created but is it going through the right quality process and all that kind of stuff really so. yeah yeah so yeah um so welcome on yeah good. um just as, as a bit of a bit of background obviously uh looking into your profile and the type of people that you've been mastering for uh is is awesome you've got some really wicked names on there but but how did you get started in in the world of just music what first turned you on and how did that kind of morph into doing what you uh, do what well, music in general was yeah. playing in a steel band at the age of like 12 at school oh nice uh be it wanting to be a pop star being a lead singer in a band yeah. after that and uh <laughs> and then failing miserably so then i was producing music on an atari and that sort of thing sort of late 90s did loads yeah. of remixes when you could get paid quite a lot for remixes so that was quite good yeah and then um yeah and at the same time i was doing mastering so it kind of, I just carried on doing mastering. It wasn't the fact that I wanted to do mastering. I didn't even know what it was when I started, but right. I just wanted to work in a studio like everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. in the late nineties, when I started, it was, you know, there was no, there was only a few studios really. It wasn't like now where everyone's got a studio in their bedroom, you know, it was, yeah. you had to go to one of the main ones. Yeah. So I wrote off handwritten letters cause no email and uh, you know, all the time. Got some letters yeah. back from places like Abbey Road saying, "Yeah, thanks very much, but, but we get no. 500 letters a day." <laughs> and then, um, and then I got a job. I, I remember because I was working in loads of really bad jobs, like most people, and I hated it. 
And it was, and I just thought if, you know, I'll do anything to get into a studio. So then I got a letter saying I I could, you know, they've got an opening in the CD mastering department. So I didn't even, I couldn't look it up because there was no Google, but I yeah. um, didn't really know what I was talking about. Went into the interview. I was confident enough to blag my way through it. And, um, and then I got a job doing that, which was kind of, yeah, it was good, but it wasn't as creative as I wanted to be really, I don't think at the yeah. time. So right. it took me years and years to kind of get my head around the fact that I didn't have to do as much as I thought I had to do, which I think a lot of people have problems with mastering doing that. They in kind terms, of, in terms of kind of like trying to put their own yeah. spin on it, or yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, because yeah. you over egg the cake a lot of the time because you, a lot of people are coming from production or mixing in the same way that I was wanting to make music, mm. and so I was making music at night in the studio. And in downtime, you know, on Atari samplers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then during the day, you know, I was just mastering things, but I was mastering good stuff as well. I was working for, because I was part of Zomba. So Zomba had all the massive Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, Stone Roses. Yeah. Um, R. Kelly, <laughs> a bit dodgy. Uh, and, <laughs> but that, and no, yeah. Not then though, who knew? No, it was part of Jive, <laughs> Jive Records was part of it and Silvertone. So they had some really good artists. And so yeah. I was in the studio. So it was kind of in-house mastering place. So I got to master tons and tons of stuff, which was cool, you know, and I didn't even realize at the time how lucky I was, I guess, to be yeah. getting all that stuff coming in because you don't get that in many places unless you're at a big studio like Abbey Road. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I sort of didn't really know what I was doing, winging it, but probably doing too much, doing much more than I needed to do. Yeah. And it, you know, it took me, probably 10 years after that to realize when I looked at all the other mastering engineers that I was working with, realizing they were doing like one setting or two settings. And I thought they were geniuses, but it was just mm. the fact that the tracks didn't actually need anything more than that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it wasn't yeah. the fact that they had some kind of crazy setting that was exciting. Yeah. It was the fact it sounded good anyway. They just needed to do a small tweak and then it's yeah. done. Yeah. But um, yeah. a lot of people, you know, that come from a mixing production background, automatically think that you're still mixing so getting through that mindset of not mixing and and actually just mastering and listening to it as a, a stereo file just as the kind of veneer of the file yeah. is a very different mindset which i think is quite hard to do that's the thing i found hard to start with yeah yeah and have you seen that sort of mindset or, or i guess the the projects that you're getting coming through to you i presume then they would have kind of changed in the way that you know, uh, if you're receiving them from a, a, a mixing engineer, you're going to get a, you're going to get a file format that's in a way that's basically prepared for mastering. Whereas if you're a lot of bands now will will have factored in the mixing process in the actual recording process, and sometimes I guess it's kind of hit or miss as to whether or not you can get a file through and just know that you can't really work on it. I think it, no, d d I've I've found that it's the same for everybody. Like okay. even massive mix engineers will send through something that's smashed. Really? Because they okay. really don't want you to touch it. They don't. Ah. They don't know unless unless you're working closely with them yeah. and they know you. If they're just if I'm getting say a file from a record label and say a big a big mix engineer's mixed it, if he hasn't got the chance to say to the mastering engineer, I want it sounding this way, then they'll usually smash it so that they know that you won't touch it and it sounds. And a lot of the time, it sounds really good anyway. So you kind of trying to put your stamp on it or trying yeah. to change it in some way is a kind of wasted effort. Yeah, because you know, and it's annoying because you really want to show off to the mix engineer how great you are and get all his work. But so, yeah, you know, I never even thought of can't. that. I never even thought of that because I mean, we we um, I say we. So this podcast is hosted by Broken Bricks, which is a, a band, right? Um, and, and we yeah. use a, um, a a mastering house, and we we always mix our own stuff, but then we send it to his or to their to their place just to kind of sweeten it up really bring out all of the tones and then master it so it's always every time we 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 always sort of record with and and mix with that kind of like headroom of knowing that a mastering engineer needs to kind of run you know through this through yeah, his yeah. outboard and, and and put it through all all the kind of limiters and compressors and stuff but i've never i never even would have dreamed that a good mixing engineer actually might just smash it so that you can't even have that room to play around with it you know it's... well a lot of the times they've smashed it because they need to send it to an a and r man and he yeah. needs to hear it loud because he can't understand that if it's not loud it's not a good mix yeah so you'll always get a mix that is a limited mix and you'll get a lot of the time the unlimited mix as well to master from yeah because yeah. obviously they need to send out a reference to everybody the band 
uh, the, you know, whoever the artist is needs to hear it with a limiter on so that when otherwise they'll all say, but it doesn't sound as good as the track that I'm listening to or when they put load it up, you know, yeah. a lot of, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people, you know, won't hear something unless it's really loud and limited because that limited sound is kind of the finished sound, if you like. Yeah, I, I mean, um, it depends on the genre. Obviously, I'm generalizing. Yeah. It totally depends yeah. on the music, the genre, what it is. If you're doing something orchestral, you're not going to be slamming it through a limiter. But if you're no. doing, like, you know, some dance thing, you're going to have it pretty loud. Yeah. How important do you think the the mastering process is in today's music? Um, it's really, I think people don't understand that mastering isn't about getting something loud. It's about yeah. getting something to sound right on a format. Yeah. And that's what it always was. Yeah. So it's always been right. You're going to, um, vinyl. So you need to be able to have the bass kind of no, no phase issues in the bass. You need to have the top. So it's not too bright. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're going to there and really you're a transfer person. You're transferring it to a format. Yeah. And so now you're transform you know, you know, you're putting it on Spotify, you're putting it onto Tidal, places like that. So you have to keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah. And that's really why you're going to a mastering studio. Yeah. You're not going there really. It's not a massively creative pro it can be, but it's not supposed to be a massively creative thing. It's supposed to be how can I get this mix that someone spent loads and loads of time on and they yeah. love. Yeah. And the band love and everyone's really happy with it. How can I get that to transfer to a format that works you know so yeah. how's yeah. that going to sound on spotify okay well i need to adjust the bass i need to adjust the tops yeah because then it will come out differently is that is, is that i mean because the, the the challenge that you've got is isn't just the platform but the device with which it's being listened to it on because you, you a lot of kids nowadays they'll just they won't even put headphones in they just put it straight on the speaker of their phone yeah, yeah and, and, and you know you, yourself like if you've got a sub in there or something yeah but you're not, yeah, you're just not going to hear it. But yeah. if you've mastered, if you, if you are master, you're always mastering just one master. You don't really want to be doing a separate one for vinyl, separate one for right. this channel, that channel. You're best saying, okay, let's get one good sounding master. Yeah, yeah. And so usually if you've mastered it well, and it's kind of, I wouldn't say flat, but it's so that all the frequencies are in the right place, then when it's reproduced on any speaker, it should sound good. Yeah, or it should sound a certain way. It's never going to have the same bass as, say, a club, and it's never going to have the same top. Yeah. Uh, you know, vinyl's not going to have the same top as a little tinny speaker. Yeah, but yeah. if you've got something sounding good, and you've got all the, you know, most of the good stuff happens in the mids. So if you've got all that sounding pretty good and pretty mm. big, then it's going to translate a lot onto most systems really you know mm. if the bass is controlled it's not going to make speakers fart when they're when there's too yeah, much bass and it's over loud you always get that kind of um you get a lot of memes and, and videos put on by you know producers online when they they do that classic um they think they've mastered it and they play it on speakers around the house and it's great and then they go and put it on in the car and it's like shit <laughs> yeah, yeah. it just sounds <laughs> so bad you know yeah. i always thought that that kind of for me is is the important part of mastering especially in in these days because it, it, your music's going to be listened to via so many different mediums and it's also exactly. yeah it, you know you've also got the challenge of um being played on radio next to other tracks that are of a certain volume you know and and if you're if if the bass just isn't cutting through or whatever next to another track where which which sounds great on the radio that's just like the, the worst nightmare for 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 a musician so yeah i guess it's kind of like um i think a lot of producers nowadays like bedroom producers kind of forget about that fact and they just go for volume yeah yeah of course which it sounds can, better yeah, but it can just totally kill <laughs> it. You know, if you're, yeah, yeah, if you're yeah. pushing the volume of some really dirty, like low mids, and it's it's just going to kill a car stereo, and you come on, you know, and 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 get and get played either by radio or someone streams it, and it sounds like shit. They'll never come back to that. You know, yeah. they'll never come back to that music again. But um, this is exactly why I say the master engineer's job's about translation. It's mm. about getting it to translate in every situation. So you know, like I know when I listen to something, I'm listening to it. In a, as a stereo track, I'm listening to the ba the the way the whole bass sounds, not just the bass instrument, yeah. and the way the top sound and the way the mids. I'm just listening in that way. I'm not listening to the individual instruments. Where if you've actually mixed it or produced it, yeah. you're always still going to have the hang-ups of the earlier stage. So if you had trouble with a vocal when you recorded it, you're still going to be hearing that when you're mixing it. If yeah. you recorded the vocal, where 
I probably won't hear that problem. So I'll just treat that in a different way and then mm. usually solve it. Or, you know, or the same with the bass. If you're yeah. having trouble getting the bass right, it's like, okay, we'll just leave the bass and I'll tighten it up and yeah. I'll yeah. cuts or whatever that needs to work. So it's kind of, um, that's why having just a mastering engineer at the end to make sure it translates well is really key. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, a lot of people don't know that. They think I can just master it myself. But if you're, if you've done the whole process, then to be able to do that yourself is pretty hard. Loads of people can do it. I'm yeah. not saying you can't do it, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. I could never master my own music when I used to produce music because I'd be too busy listening to how all the yeah. instruments were sounding. I was still in mix head. Yeah. And, and cause I was producing it, I was kind of producing and mixing at the same time. Yeah. So I'd always get someone else to master it. Yeah. I think you, 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 well, you does not even think about it. You definitely don't not just develop ear fatigue, but you actually, when, when your brain knows a song so well, it almost cancels out or adds certain frequencies in it, it, you know, <laughs> yeah, just so, yeah. so actually you, you come in to master it. You're probably you're probably trying to master kind of like tones that aren't even there or something. Or yeah, I think you need you need to have that uh, that 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 second or third pair of ears, you know, just to kind of well, a lot of new score. mastering engineers will come at it, and when I'm talking to them and they're saying, "Oh, I can't get my head around this sound," they've got a sound going on in the mix that I can't. It's doing my head, and I've tried everything to try and get it out. Yeah. And then I'll listen to it and I can't even hear the sound or I can see what they're saying, but it's not bothering me yeah. because I'm not diving that deep into the actual instruments and the sound like that. I don't listen like that. Yeah. I'm yeah. listening kind of as a punter listens, Yeah, you know, I'm not, yeah. uh, I'm kind of listening just for the, right. How does that sound to the outside world? Yeah. Not how does that sound as a producer? Otherwise you'd go crazy. You wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I suppose as well, um, I've known some people that have got barely any gear, but they do somehow a wonderful job with very little gear. And I've I've known other people that have got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of stuff. And you, if you put the two masters next to each other, you, you know, you, you wouldn't be, you'd have to be kind of keen of ear to, to pick out the, the differences yeah. or pick out which one's got 200 grand worth of gear. So where do you sit on that kind of like, how important is it to, to have well, the ATCs all. and all of this kind of stuff? Or can you achieve you know, greatness um, from your bedroom. The main thing that you need to have before you have equipment is you need to know your room. You need to have your room set up properly. Yeah. Whether you've got amazing speakers or really rubbish speakers, if you put those speakers in the right on stands in the right place and they're pointing at your ears and you, if you've got a bad room, as long as you've got your first reflection points covered yeah. and you've got, so all the basics of getting a room sounding right. Um, and if you can't get a room sounding right, then get some really good headphones yeah. because if you can't hear what you're doing, you're always going to over EQ or overdo something because you can't hear, you know, what needs to be changed. So yeah. that's why, in a, why a lot of high end mastering rooms are expensive because they need to have very tuned rooms or at least, you know, be able to know the room really well. It takes a while to get used to a room yeah. so that you yeah. know what tweaks to do and what not to do. And then when it comes to the equipment, you don't need, you need an EQ and a compressor and a limiter and that's yeah. it. Because he, he, if, you, if you go back to how studios were before we had a million plugins, you had I had one I had one EQ and I had to use that on every single track and I knew yeah. that EQ like the back of my hand. Yeah. And the yeah. same with a compressor, I knew how to push it, when to use it, when not to use it, when to just run through it. And it's kind of you have to get used to that, and that's yeah. a brilliant way to start with anything. And then I always say to people, just bring then one thing in occasionally, but don't bring it in to your actual work that you're doing for people just sort yeah. of bring it in occasionally play with it see what it sounds like get used to it yeah. and then maybe it'll appear in your you know your template but yeah. um yeah i mean i i always i mean something like a Masalek eq for me i've used it all my career i'm like you know it's a brilliant tool it's like yeah. a you know it, i could use that on everything and get something good out of it yeah like you say so it's not the fact of i think the more stuff you have the more chance you've got of just throwing loads of stuff at it and then you end up just turning things up and down. Yeah. You know, you're turning it up with one EQ, turning it down with another one. Yeah. And then you've got a compressor compressing it there and you're doing the bass there and the top there and DSing it here. And it's like, whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Need it's, any of that. I know. It quickly gets out of hand. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Um, especially when you've already done a bunch of that stuff in the mix. Because if you've, if you've compressed every channel and yeah. you've EQ'd every channel and then you go and compress it more, you're just getting that kind of squashed and then you're you pushing just, the yeah, volume. You can't. 
that's why it can uh, you'll find these days most mastering engineers don't use compressors that much yeah i, I was the interested aren't dynamic enough yeah i saw you talking about this on your on your profile and i was i think that was one of the key things i thought that's an interesting thing because i wouldn't have even ever thought you know i, I wouldn't yeah, have, i tend to I thought, use them just to run through to get flavor i do i do sometimes use like an ssl compressor yeah. to get a bit of kind of if I need to glue it a little bit, but yeah. I'm if I see the meters move, basically it means I'm doing too much. So that's right, okay. kind of uh, because, like you say, you're so compressed already that you're so loud. Any small change that you do in mastering makes a huge difference because yeah. everything's so pushed together. Yeah. So even, that's why you only do like half a dB EQ tweaks and stuff yeah. because yeah. it makes a huge difference to the sound yeah. at that point. So yeah. it's like compressors. They're just, I don't know, you don't, you're trying to open things up. You're trying to get things loud and open and you're not wanting them to be crushed and, and small. Yeah. So most compressors are doing that by yeah. nature of the beast. So it's kind of, yeah, for control, maybe in the low end, I might use a multi-band and yeah. maybe a de in the in the tops to control that. But it's more for control rather than like crushing it or pushing it together. That's yeah. kind of, like you say, most people have done that on the mix bus anyway, really. Yeah, yeah. Are you leaning more into kind of vir the virtual plugins um, for EQs and compressors and all that kind of thing? Or are you still, I um, mean, because the, the originals are, are always going to be the greatest, right? But the, you can get some crazy plugins now for... Yeah, I mean, I, there's, I'm kind of, I'm definitely a mixture of the two. Because yeah. there, if I, I did a, a video recently just to kind of show people that when you just run in and out of say i've got a helo here which is a lot of people will have yeah and just running in and out of that with some cables just to show okay how much that changes the sound so do it that's kind of without any hardware in between so yeah. when you're going through electronics that obviously changes the sound and that the makeup of going through different bits of equipment before and after each other changes the vibe and the sound and the mixture of the color so yeah that's kind of what you're doing with hardware, but you can do that with software too. But there's just, I don't know, it's like more, I would say it's more of a depth thing still mm. with having adding a, a flavor of analog. There's a little bit more depth to the sound. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, I use plugins probably 60% of the work is done on plugins because yeah. I can do like more tricks with them if I yeah. need to do that, if I yeah. like a lot more MS stuff. But all this stuff is stuff that I learned in hardware right. by but having to do it by ear rather than by looking. Yeah. So that's the benefit of hardware yeah. is that you're using your ear, you're learning by using your ears, which is massively important. Yeah. So yeah. I I'd run through a Masalek EQ, have it in MS mode, and then work out what it was doing by listening rather yeah. than, you know, seeing on the screen. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't get that these days if they've come from in the box they they all they're yeah. doing is doing everything by meters and by eyes yeah yeah no seriously i've, I've seen some then, people um mixing without the sound on just yeah. just doing it by eyes just because you can see the flat <laughs> frequencies there you know if i've got like a hi-hat that frequency is there and i can see the sibilances on the vocal is the same so just scoop one out yeah. like yeah, i don't yeah. know <laughs> it's just craziness yeah but um yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I'd want to have to. I'd need. I need to hear everything I'm doing. Also, I like hardware because it's more fun. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get. I didn't get into being an engineer to be on a computer. Otherwise, I'd be yeah. a programmer. So yeah, it's yeah. like or an accountant or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I did it because I saw a big recording studio and there's loads of knobs there, and I wanted to turn them, and that yeah. was the geek in me wanting to do that. So having no hardware at all kind of gets boring. I've yeah. I've done it loads of times. There's loads of tracks that I just do in the box, but it's just boring. Yeah. It's not as much fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, talking about in the box, what we can't name names, but what what's your thoughts around the um, the platforms that you can just upload a, an MP3 or a WAV to, and it will do an automatic mastering? Yeah. What well, you know? Uh, I've got a kind. Of, I see it in the way of as an analogy for you. Um, suits from okay. so where, years ago everyone had a tailor everyone had a bespoke suit in the 60s 70s or whatever and then they started doing off the peg stuff mm. where anyone could walk into marks and spencers who didn't really know about suits and just go okay that one fits me and it looks yeah. all right and everyone yeah. who's not into suits goes yeah it looks all right that mate but yeah. if you know about suits then you know about the cut you know about the style you know about how you want it to look you know about all yeah. the details about it and that's kind of the same with mastering it's like yeah, you can get a job that will 
get it all right. It'll be louder and it will might be a bit less dull. Yeah. Uh, but you won't get a, an individual bespoke sound from that. Yeah. And for the amount you're paying, it's, you know, you can get someone to master something pretty cheaply. So at least you can try and get a bespoke kind of sound. Yeah. So I, I can see, I can see also for people using it, it's a quick, it's a quick win. If you've got a load of catalog to use, for example, and you haven't got, I don't know, it's a, um, if you've got 20 tracks to do and you just need to get them louder and sort mm. of get a rough idea, then yeah, why not? It works. It gets you a sound. It gets you louder. I mean, anybody that's into their sound would probably say, yeah, but it doesn't sound very good, does it? It doesn't mm. sound like, it sounds a little bit weird. It sounds a bit of that. Yeah. But if you're a normal person yeah. who, like, who isn't us, who knows about sound or cares, probably then not even gonna notice, who gives you? a shit? They're like, it's yeah. three quid. You're a hundred. <laughs> well, what, what do I want to do that for? Yeah. I, I think you know, there's also this new world of... Um, of of how to make music as a musician in 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 the, in the sl- sort of slightly non conventional ways, and, w- and one of those is uh, beat making. Enzo, be quiet. Sorry, <laughs> nice name by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, one of those is just they just churn out beats. So so you know you've got the yeah sit and make beats and then you'll quickly master them and load them up. I guess maybe for that it's kind of exactly. okay if you're selling yeah, yeah. little beat loops, you don't really care. But, um, that's right so it's fine it's like it's horses for courses really it is like yeah. a suit isn't it you go into a wedding you need a suit quick get yourself down m and s yeah you know you're not going to go to a tailor on savile row and get it get one all cut ready for you are you you know no. unless you're really into it exactly so it's, yeah it's kind of high fashion against you know uh primark yeah 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 so um, it suits some people and doesn't i think there's a place for it i also think the good thing that came out of it was that it more, made more people actually know what mastering was or appreciate what mastering was. Yeah. So I think that's quite good because before when I was starting, no one really, only people in the music industry knew what mastering was. Yeah. If you were, uh, it was part of the process. So no one really knew that outside of yeah. sort of record labels. So that's kind of changed a lot, which is why more people are into it. More people do it. And, you know, so from a publicity point of view, it kind of works as well. Yeah. I don't know how they I don't know how they make any money from it because it's um it must have uh, cost a lot to build in the first place so they need to you know get their profits back but yeah I, I know yeah. I know I know a lot of them kind of market themselves as you know Grammy award winning mastering engineers have sort of built this and you're like right okay so yeah. is it just like a couple of plugins on <laughs> and you just <laughs> yeah you, they receive the file and it spits it back well out. I mean I could do a standard setting for most things that you'd be more than happy with yeah you exactly. know what I mean? I could yeah. say, okay, make sure it's going in at this level, yeah. right? Here's a yeah. here's a basic EQ setting that will treat most, which will make most stuff sound better. Yeah. And as long as it's coming back out at this level via, I don't know, FabFilter Pro L two, yeah. then you'll be or you'll be more than happy with that, and it will probably yeah. beat Lander. But yeah. you know, that's that's just one setting. Yeah. That doesn't mean that that's right for everybody, and it yeah. isn't. You know, I don't yeah. use the same thing for everybody every single track oh, do you normally just take one file uh or or do you take separate stems as in like a maybe like this the low end and vocals as a separate and then everything else on one like take three or four separate I stems prefer, yeah i prefer sort of stem mastering and stem stem mastering is really just for balance okay. if you want to rebalance something or you might change the you know you might tweak a vocal or something if it's really weird you can get into it and start messing yeah. around with it but I tend to always ask people for the stereo version first because I want to hear what they wanted what they it thought. to sound yeah. like. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, okay, I know the sort of the stems will, but it seems like a waste of their money to pay for stem mastering when it's like, okay, let's listen to what you've got. Yeah. <laughs> and then if it's if it's needs a tweak, I'll ask them for a tweak. And if not, then I'll say, have you got the stems? Yeah. Um, you're not necessarily going to get a, a better master from doing the stems because I think people have the perception that that's, that's the way, but I think that's more stem mixing than stem mm-hmm. mastering. Stem mastering is just about, okay, the balance is a little bit off. Yeah. Or when I'm going into the limiter, it's getting a bit bright, so I can just adjust the, the bass levels and the, and the top, and it's actually without me EQing it. So yeah. you, can do, you can do that kind of thing with it, but most of the time it's, um, yeah, it's easier just to work from the, the stereo and sort of work from, what they, you know, from where their mind was. Yeah. So, so what what would you say is sort of like the three most important things uh, to bear in mind when you're prepping a track for mastering? Um, 
well, you need to leave. It's nice to leave a little bit of level, but also I think a lot of people mix into limiters now. So mm. I, I always want to hear the limited version. And uh, the way I suggest people mix is so that they've got the mix after so they can at least turn that off and then, yeah. um, and, and they can always tell me what they, what they had on the limiter. So that, yeah, they add plus three on the limiter. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. As soon as it comes to me, then I can add plus three and mm-hmm. then it's exactly how they liked it yeah. in their studio. But I can take that limiter off, do a bit of stuff to it. And then most stuff I've got to turn down anyway to get through all the analog equipment. Because if it comes in too loud, then I yeah. need to turn it down. Yeah, I read about that actually. Because um, apparently the 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 VSTs or the plugins um, that they've made operate in the same kind of way, but most people are putting everything in too hot, and so you're only getting like sixty percent of the actual plugin working or, or whatever. So is that the same in in in? It's in more the- to, yeah. For for me, it's more to do with gain staging and making sure you're not overloading certain bits of equipment. Some right. equipment likes it better hotter. And some doesn't, you know, some older stuff will, you know, start distorting if you push in too hard on them. Yeah. Um, yeah. New, you know, newer high end stuff can handle quite a lot of level going in, yeah. but it's, it, you know, part of getting a really loud dynamic sound is to gain stage through equipment. Okay. So, so if you've got the opportunity to do that, if it's not already crushed to death, yeah. you can get a really good loud sort of perce- more perceived loudness as well, rather than just, it can still be like low level, but it can be sound louder, you know, come across as louder because of the way that you've gain staged it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You hear that a lot in the more sort of minimal sound. Uh, I guess things like Billie Eilish, if you've ever listened to that, it's yeah, actually yeah. not that loud, but it sounds loud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. It's it's because interesting... there's The main thing with that kind of music is because there's so much space and so much, white space if you like in between the sounds yeah your ear perceives it your ear picks it up better so when you've got loads of you know if you if you think to a lot of hip-hop where they've got say three or four instruments playing yeah and nothing else then it sounds really loud because yeah Yeah. you know it's like a painting you can see all the colors and the white shows off the colors more yeah so it's like um so that's kind of how I see it. And I can also, you can get those things really loud because you've got the space to push into all yeah. the instruments together a bit more. You can yeah. crush them up a, just a touch more. And then that's so much louder than if they're all, if there's too much going on, there's no space and they're all congested. And then you've got to try and pick the, con, you know, you've got to try and pick the congestion out yeah. by doing cuts or, you know, stretching it out so that you can get some space. Yeah. Because the space yeah. is what gives you that kind of perceived loudness. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget about that as well. It's kind of just keep loading things up on top, put a guitar there, yeah. put this yeah, there, yeah. that there, and then and then they can't understand why. And then you just want it loud, and you're just pushing all of those elements up, so it, you don't get any, and you cl- get har- any clarity. With, if it's acoustic instruments, it also you get a lot of harmonics clashing. Yeah. So when you get that happening, you can't get it loud. That's why you can get dance music really loud, because a lot of it is done electronically, so there's not as many yeah. sort of acoustic harmonics. So it's like you can really push them to get into each other all the sounds yeah yeah. and they can still sound really loud but if it's acoustic instruments it starts distorting or you know it's just harder to get it louder yeah 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 so in terms of uh your career what what sort of advice would you give somebody now that's looking at mastering as a potential area that they want to get involved in? in 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 the current state of play what would be your sort of top three bits of advice to someone wanting to break into that space um I think you've got to, it's all about your network and it's all of, you've got to remember that 80% is marketing, 20% is mastering. And that's the same for anybody that wants to be a producer, an engineer, a a, a recording artist, whatever. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter how good you are. If no one knows you, they can't buy anything from you. So that's whether that's a song, a t-shirt or, you know, mastering in my case. So, yeah. Um, I think that's the number one thing because there's so much noise going on to get, you need to try and get above it somehow yeah. and then, and then be good enough to be able to do it when you're, when you get there. But um, the ideal thing is to try and work with people that have got a network and have got people so that you can be sort of their junior and then come up through the ranks, similar to what I did. I know that's a long time ago when I did it, but that was the biggest uplift for me working with a guy called Kevin Metcalf, who was like the biggest mastering engineer in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. 
And then I went to Metropolis. And so all the guys that are there, that kind of helped me sort of, you know, you're bouncing off other people's networks or even just being in the same room as people. Yeah. So just to try and get in any places like that is cool. Just by offering, I'll help you with your social media. I'll help you. Yeah edit your videos in my case or whatever you want me to do i'll do it can you can i just sit in on sessions learn how to do it and yeah. off we go yeah i think starting from scratch on your own in your bedroom is fine but you're going to be working for free for a long time yeah until you build up your clients and build up your regular work and then you're only going to be able to charge a little bit because you've got no um you know you've got no no big artist to bounce off and yeah. back of so that, that kind of just takes a long time but it's definitely totally to do with who you know so you need to be going to gigs you need to be hanging out with a men you need to be letting them know who you are what you do yeah you need to do stuff for them for free you need to get in with bands that are young that aren't signed yet or you think are good or yeah. you hear are good so you've got to put the put the legwork in yeah 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 uh, um, again another i think there's there's a, a world of people now that are kind of you know Start, they, they don't even look at careers now. They just see how can I sell beats or how can I set up a five, yeah, yeah. A five you know, Fiverr. Have you seen that yeah, website yeah, yeah, where course, you can just yeah. go on and get any services? Yeah, yeah. That's the kind time. of they go down those routes now, and I think, I think that's fine. Yeah. I think you can. Do, I think the great. I've got kids, and I think the great thing is these days, if you've got a passion for anything, you can make a living at it. There's an outlet somewhere. Yeah, there is. But <laughs> yeah. the pro, but the thing is, you've also got to remember with that is that you have to put the work in to get the work. Yeah. So it's like, it's okay saying, okay, I'm really into knitting and I love knitting patterns and they're amazing. But unless everybody who wants knitting patterns knows who you are, they're not going to be able to buy your knitting patterns. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like, you have to be out there doing stuff, telling people, hanging out with the right people, talking to, you know, whoever who's going to then hire you yeah. in one way or another. You know, even if you're a DJ, you need to be speaking to promoters you need to be hanging out with other djs you need to be yeah. doing remixes you need to be promoting yourself and doing free events you know yeah. so i think it's, it is great that people can go on fiverr and sell for 20 quid to do whatever they want but uh, you're you know you're that's only going to get you the only people that are going to those sites are people similar to you who haven't got who aren't going anywhere doing stuff so it's yeah. like you need yeah, to yeah. only stay on those sites for a certain period of time yeah. before you need to break into hopefully doing some better work and better things that are going to get you working on some more interesting stuff and better things yeah. with people who are doing it professionally and and then you can make a living at it and then that's obviously what someone wants to do isn't it make a living at doing it yeah that's it that's it and and then and then gear wise i mean uh what would you be your go-to things you'd say the eq uh if it was me starting now i would just buy the fab filter bundle and Fabfilter. that would be it or ozone so I'd buy those, I'd buy either of those and that would be a job done. And I would sit and learn those in the same way that I sat and learned uh, an EQ, a GML 9500. I, I know, you know, I spent 15 years on that. Yeah. So that's, I'd learn the Q3, the FabFilter Q3. It does everything you need it to do. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You could throw in some other stuff for a bit of color, but you need to know before you can start thinking about adding color to things you need to know what you're doing you need to know what 5k sounds like you need to know what the 12k yeah. shelf sounds like and on what music that works with and yeah. when yeah. and why you shouldn't be using it and when you should not be using it and when yeah. you should put a low cut in and when you shouldn't and that takes so long to and so many tracks that's why you have to work for free on loads and loads and loads of tracks to understand what how to use that equipment at the right time yeah yeah you'll only learn from from using it yeah and you'll get distracted if you if you didn't just have the fab filter bundle or the ozone you'll get distracted like we said earlier with mm. a million plugins and then you're not going to get anywhere because you're learning 50 things at once yeah 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 yeah, yeah. in the How same way i always say to people learn to be a mastering engineer or learn to be a mixing engineer or learn to be a producer don't try and do all three mm. because you're wasting your energy on all three you can do all three but it's going to take you probably three times as long to get as good yeah. at all three yeah so um i would say it's the same thing with equipment just learn one eq don't learn four at a time yeah yeah um, that's, that's I, good fortunately yeah. i was limited in the fact that i didn't have enough hardware to learn yeah. anymore yeah so it was it was handy in a way yeah yeah well now it's the flip side of that especially now since they've started doing um subscriptions on plugins and stuff you know you, yeah, yeah. you can pay 20 quid a month ish and get mm. access to 250 different plugins yeah well actually Mental. 
if you know how 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 much time do you have to spend with each one in order to get it to a place where you actually could sell that as a service you know to you know yeah well i remember thinking back like when i used to go to this when i was at battery and they had all the recording studios there and you've got a rack of equipment behind you that's the same as having 20 plugins mm. but they were the hardware and i didn't even know how to use any of them <laughs> You know, probably the yeah. EQ or something. But looking at them all, it's like, oh my god, it's going to take me years to know how to work this. Yeah. And when I did used to use it on my productions, I was so bad with it. I didn't know what to do with it. So yeah. that must be the same for somebody with zero knowledge starting out. So you're you're better off just going right. Forget all of that shit behind me and just learn yeah. this desk. And once yeah. I know the desk, then I'll move on to that EQ over there or that yeah. compressor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also uh, tons of online tutorials and stuff you can take now. But then again. Yeah. You, I think it's a good advice that you need to pick what what it is that you need to learn about and then start using it in the practical sense so that yeah. you can figure out how it works for you as well. Yeah, um, and if you like it, I mean that's the quite that's kind yeah. of the good thing about going to music college these days. I was always against it because I never did, but I kind of like the idea of it. Just you know, because kids have to do something for two years now, from sixteen to eighteen. So you might, if you want to do music using that two years to find an area of music that you actually like yeah because you might think oh i'm going to be a mix engineer because you've got this bright idea that you're going to make loads of money as a mix engineer and you might yeah. hate it or be really bad at it yeah, yeah so yeah. you might be really good at marketing so go into the marketing department of uh, of a record label you'll have a yeah. great time it's all young yeah. people you'll have so much fun yeah. And it'll be much better than sitting in a dark room on your own <laughs> if you're not that sort of person. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. kind of, it is quite good to go into those places now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're also a different, you can do a lot of stuff virtually now in courses and things like that as well. But um, so in terms of the services that you offer uh, now, are you doing kind of that, that sort of thing, like online courses and tutorials and things like that? Have you I do, yeah. I've got an yeah. academy, yeah. A full academy for that, yeah. Mar mixing and mastering, yeah. Yeah, as well as uh, continuing to to mix and master for... Uh... I, don't mi I don't mix, but I master. I'm sorry, master, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm mastering all the time, and so then I've made the course, and that's basically there for people to take if they take it, and then I speak to them once a week on the course. Okay. So okay. we then have like a Zoom like this where yeah. I chat and everyone can come in whenever they like and ask questions and things. Okay. So... But most of the t most of the work on the course has been done already. I'm still yeah. mastering every day. Yeah, I don't okay. do any kind of one to one stuff. That's yeah, too much and, like hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and how does the course work then? If you're doing sort of Zoom sessions as well, have you, is there kind of a time period that you can sign because, up for the course, or is it, or can you get most of it in video format and then it's just all catch videos? So basically, yeah. the course is videos. It goes over. It used to go over eight weeks, but everyone moaned at me, so I've now done it. So it releases every few days. Okay, because there's quite a lot of information, and the, the reason why that is is because I wanted them to take it on board and learn each section. So it's yeah. like taking them from nowhere to the to being able to master yeah so that's quite a big process and quite a lot to take on yeah and so it's kind of the whole point of it is they learn it the the basic skills within there and then they they kind of it's it's open forever so then they just come into the into the zoom chat can ask questions i'll help them along the way or they'll send me tracks i'll give yeah. them a bit of advice mm -hmm. so it's not totally hands-off i have to at least yeah. say okay i've listened to that if i was you i'd I would have DS that or I would have done this, you know? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's yeah. in a way, in a way that I used to get that from like Kevin, who was the main guy that, that taught me, I kind of see it in the same way, but with loads of people. So I would go into the studio and say to him, Oh, look, have a listen to this. What do you think? And then he'd go, Oh, I'd have done this, that. And so then that was cool. Cause that's how I learned. Right. So that's kind of the way that I would like to teach other people because yeah. there's loads of skills that I learned from him and from other guys that are now retired that won't get passed down the chain yeah so it's like all the things that the way that i master is probably very different to someone who's 20 that masters just with yeah. plugins so yeah. yeah um you know so to pass on that experience and knowledge is quite cool and it's um yeah it's quite re rewarding in a way i always sort of i fought against it for years but i actually quite enjoy it okay okay and uh, how do people find it uh, streakyacademy.com streakyacademy.com um you've got info on there they can just sign yeah, yeah. up and and off they go. Yeah. And uh, is it the same on the socials? Streaky Academy or are you Streaky Academy on social media? Yeah. And Streaky. So Streaky Academy is where you can go to like learn stuff. So you can go and see all my tips and tricks and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. And then Streaky, my normal Streaky stuff is where you'll see the things I'm working on, the equipment that I'm 
playing around with or yeah and some more my mastering things yeah cheeky giveaways and things like that yeah exactly yeah 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 cool (laughs) cool well uh actually gave away a mass select compressor oh nice interesting i hit 50k on youtube and i've given away a mass select compressor so lovely cool yeah that was a bit shocking but i i was desperate for the 50k (laughs) (laughs) and they made sure they got it and so i uh, wow yeah so some lucky punters getting that nice cool Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking a bit of time to to come on. That's right. And uh, it's been been lovely chatting to you. And uh, yeah, good luck with it all. Nice one. Okay, well, good luck with this. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. All right. See you in the future. All right, speak to you again soon. Bye now. Bye.